Is you all show up? Ooh, all right. It says I'm live. Okay. Somebody kindly check. Now that's emotion. I hope uh, Zoom is capturing that too. Okay. Um, is anybody able to check that I'm live? And thank no, you. Everybody. you're live. You're awesome. live on LinkedIn. Okay. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Okay, so um, hello everyone. This is uh, Sudha Jamte, and this is our uh, usual weekly wed, our happy time speaker series where we come and learn something new. And this week, I am coming in to do a webinar about large language models, landscape, LLM landscape. And there are some of you who are new. And so uh, I have to give my us usual disclaimer and spiel. Uh, we are streaming this live on LinkedIn and on YouTube. So if you are watching there, uh, I'm not coming back to YouTube to take questions, but I will uh, look at uh, LinkedIn and take your questions or somebody might volunteer and even you know bring the questions here for me. And uh, if you're coming to come back and watch this later, you can watch the recording. So because we are recording and streaming, we will repurpose this content and, and uh, put this out again. Everybody who's here on the Zoom, uh, go off camera or don't speak. And so your voice won't get recorded if you do not want to you know, be included in the stream and recordings. And you can always be here on the chat and ask questions. And that's OK, too. So uh, thank you, everyone, for hanging in here patiently and coming back, especially for my students who are regulars. You know, you all have a life and you come back. I appreciate that. OK, so um, I have done LLM 1 and LLM 2 as two different webinars. And then now we have a whole bunch of excitement with a lot of announcements around you know, in the LLM world. So I thought what I'm going to do today is give you the lay of the land of the LLM landscape. And it's easy to, you know, there are a lot of pundits and every VC firm has one. I'm not going to be one of them. My job is to teach you to think and have a discussion so that we can take this forward. And I hope every one of you who's watching this is going to do something with this. And I'm going to give this from an enterprise lens so that, you know, if you are one of those people who talked to me recently or you are going to think about how you're going to bring this to go build a startup or, you know, uh, where there is a gap or you're helping some clients or you're doing this for your own business where you're saying, OK, what makes sense? How do I think about this? And so I'm going to focus on how do you slice and dice the LLM space? in terms of different ways of thinking about this so that you can make an informed decision on how you would actually be uh, using this, right? And how do you make a selection of LLM to go forward from here? Okay. Are you guys able to hear any other background noise here from, from my world here or not? Just show me show of hands, yes or no, that's fine. No, sir. It's okay. clear. Okay, awesome. OK, so uh, since we did a LLM uh, uh, one, uh, two webinar, uh, it's there on uh, weekly where from wherever uh, you signed up. Otherwise, we'll come and put this on the chat for uh, those of you on LinkedIn who don't have access to it already. OK, but since you are here, I'm going to start with a quiz uh, so that, you know, at least we have I always do this. I like you to be in the same starting point with me. And again, no question is bad, uh, no answer is bad, and we are here to learn together, okay? Okay, and uh, I would also appreciate if you can put your name here and, and uh, say from where you are, if you want to share more, you're welcome, you can give your LinkedIn or anything else, because as much as this is a webinar and interaction and you're going to learn from me, you're going to learn from each other. Everyone here is an amazing person, so remember that, okay? Okay, so I'm going to go share the deck. And I will put this deck also up on uh, Weekly Wed where you signed up uh, on uh, teachable.com on Business School of AI. Okay, so um, I am going to go to slideshow mode, but I'm going to skip most of my intro for those of you who know me, I'm Sudha Jamte. I'm a technology futurist. That's my social handle. So you can find me on all kinds of social media, but 
given our professional contact, what we are talking about, LinkedIn would be the best way to contact me. And I am coming from a place of having worked in technology industry primarily. So I've interacted with other companies. I have worked with other companies, helped build solution for other companies from technology industry. So I've interacted with you if you're in enterprise industry, purely as either a technologist who is building innovation for the company or who is bringing in a technology. So I always talk about thinking about this as, are you working in the technology industry, building the technology and you're the technology vendor, or you could be a solution provider, or you could be uh, innovation or technology business manager, various different roles. Th these days, since everything is getting digitized, there are several roles where you play a, a role with technology. So I want you to be cognizant of that as we go through this discussion, because it is very important. Are you building core technology and launching it out as API, especially if you're a product manager for LLMs? Are you building LLMs? and you're going to be launching it out. Are you in the API world generating this API, scaling these APIs to various developers? And we have had a recent dev day from OpenAI. There is a dev day that's coming up from uh, NVIDIA next week. So thinking about you know, a product management for API, building out API, what is now called as the API economy is one thing. And the other thing is if you are a technology manager, business manager, AI ethicist, in any other job function, legal, uh, HR operations, all kinds of, and recently we congratulated Mike Berry, who has joined Adobe as a a senior director for uh, continuation and, and uh, delivery operations of business. So there are various different roles. We might not even know that unless we are in that world, but everything is using technology and you're funding technology as a customer. Is that your role? So then think about that. So what you should expect in this webinar and stay on if this is what you're thinking about it is we'll do a little refresher. That's the quiz for the students who are here on, uh, um, on Zoom. Um, and, um, you know, for others, uh, you can chat on the, on the, uh, site itself on the well, LinkedIn chat. Okay. So, um, is everybody able to see my window? Is somebody speak up and tell me because I'm just sharing from, uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So. We're going to do the quiz part. So I've already given you a heads up on what this is going to be. I don't care if you talk to ChatGPT by the side or if you do a Google by the side, but I want answers, okay? Uh, we did this on what are large models, uh, large uh, language models, LLM, and how they work. So I'm going to go into the how they work part because we need that to understand when you're picking decisions, right? And then, as I said in the beginning, this LLM landscape, one way of thinking about it is, you know, open and closed source. That's a common thing that you will hear. But I want you to think about other dimensions to it. That's what we're going to be covering. And the last piece is you're not buying an LLM. You're not investing in an LLM for the sake of the joy of an LLM. It has to do something to integrate into your enterprise workflow. How is that possible? How is it available? And that's going to impact your decision also. Okay. So... Uh, I've already spoken about myself, but for those of you who are new, at least this is one thing you should see is the newsletter link, okay? That's where all my world of shares that I do through the week is all going to show up there, okay? So uh, let me get out of the share window so that I can see you guys here. One minute, back here. Back to my Zoom, okay. So um, for... I see some message. Oh, good. Awesome. Oh, Yash, uh, Vanama uh, Yashwant is also here. Thank you, Yash, for talking to me uh, last night. And uh, I hope you will be able to, you know, had your experience of working with LLM, especially you came and spoke to us about Langchain. So uh, with recent announcement, you know, there's been uh, things that have been added in one of the larger uh, uh, LLM models, which promises something that Langchel is offering. So uh, having you here is very, very valuable. I appreciate that. Okay. Yeah, so uh, I have the first question for you. Um, what do large language models do? When we say LLM, what do they really do? And you can just chat your answer. That's why I've come out of the share. So I want to see that. What do LLMs do? 
Again, there's no bad answer and nobody on the stream or anywhere is going to see the chat, right? And this chat is uh, what everybody else in the, in the webinar Zoom room is going to see. And uh, so that's only people. And we are here to learn together. And if I had not done my own webinar or prepared for it, I don't know whether I'll be answering these questions. Um, they can do everything that you think is possible. Okay, that's that's too much. Okay, um, if I had more time, I will test this uh, my imagination on what I want to do and what the LLM will do for me. Um, they can write poems. They can summarize and translate are two things. Okay, they can write some kind of content. They can summarize content. So the AI assistant from Zoom that is listening to this transcript, it's not going to record anything. Uh, it's not looking at our chat, but it is listening to my voice, which is becoming, uh, which is transcribed. And then it's going to summarize for us. So that is uh, LLM. Okay. Uh, what else? What else? Okay. Hey, Adam, I didn't notice you were here. Welcome. Um, okay. Do you have an answer for uh, what the LLM does? They see and think. Think is again a stretch, but that's okay. Um, they can help with understanding all research papers. Yes, spoken like a true uh, researcher. Uh, yes. Uh, they take a large body of text and summarize it. Yes. So there are two pieces here. They take in a large body of uh, text and they summarize it. And I'm very glad uh, that you mentioned this uh, because... Uh, People, when they're thinking about the LLM, they're always thinking about inference, right? Uh, if you remember, when we did the understanding the LLM piece, uh, there is the, the training, pre-training, where two pieces that I was talking about, uh, how to think about it. So uh, the thing with the LLM is it's large language models, and they are actually, uh, they can ingest a huge volume of data that's you know that's the, the part where they take in the data in training and then they can actually summarize so everybody has said the summarize part they can do more i think somebody mentioned the translate part and then you know uh, uh yashwant has amazing expectations and uh, i hope you will make it work to think the way you want at least you're i think you're going to the the reasoning part so that's not bad we'll 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 touch upon that in a minute it is also some of the architecture who said that no um they have a huge uh, they have a huge understanding umesh welcome uh due to semantic and um syntactic relationship between the words. So uh, in the brain of the AI, the way it understands, it's more deeper with more connections than other typical AI from the past. So that's a very good point. OK, uh, it is also some of the architecture framework of data modeling to uh, data dictionary and uh, linguistic. OK, so uh, the so the data part is the, tra the training data, how it is stored, how it makes the connection of all the data that is fed into its training. And uh, so in the brain of the LLM. So very good, very good. I'm very happy with all the answers. Okay, I'm not going to LinkedIn to see your answers. So uh, the, the most important thing, you know, when you think about LLM, uh, Yes, we have some developers who are using the API and they are look, playing with regular machine learning and deep learning model. And uh, is LLM a deep learning model? Yes or no question. And I want fast answers because I don't want to spend too much time just on the, the recall. Uh, they see and think. Yes, OK. Uh, what else? Yes, yes, OK. So. Uh, Previously, we had machine learning, deep learning, and we said structured data, supervised learning, unstructured data, uh, unsupervised learning. And what uh, some of the people here in the chat are saying about the thinking part is uh, essentially in how it is building a neural network, but it is a stronger neural network, right, in, in its brain. And uh, 
from a user perspective, all this excitement came because of ChatGPT. And now there is the more promise of going building more chatbots. So if you came into this thinking that, you know, you're going to get a lay of the land of various different tools to build chatbots, this is not it. Because there is going to be, I can give you that because there are more options. And I'm actually in the process of building out some chatbots with my own book and stuff. Uh, and I want to, I'm thinking about, would it be a good exercise to engage you all to go in this journey with me as I'm playing with different LLMs to put my book and chat with it and say, ah, this is not, you know, privacy preserving enough. This is not letting me build out the UI the way I want and, and things like that. And there must be more in how I'm thinking about in evaluating LLMs. And I'm, I'm considering, you know, creating a course or engaging you into a lab mode in some form. But at its core, when we talk, talked about the training, pre-training, and its brain is stronger, and then it can write poetry, and it can think and reasoning. We'll come to that. Uh, at, at a minimum, it can it can write. So, And it is taking the dictionary and the linguistics, right? So that is the big piece. And generative AI is a big buzz, and generative AI is generating content and code and the all the words that we are talking about. So at a minimum, what a large language model is doing, it is doing the next word prediction, and it is using transformer models. And uh, how do LLMs work? They are, I'm going to go back to share so I can uh, zip through this, and then I will pass and ask a question. OK, guys? Uh, one second. OK, so how do they work? They are built using a transformer model, and it creates the mental map. This is the one people said they ingest the content, and you know it can take large volume of content, and how it is mapping the relationship of words to other words, right? And why are LLMs called large language models? Because it is truly large, right? But that it can take the entire internet, it can take a larger volume of training data than from the past. And because it is a neural network, it has weights and biases in how it is stored. It is storing knowledge. So all this training data, once it is fed into the, uh, the LLM during the training phase, it takes the words and it is creating word embeddings. Then it is creating a number called vectorization. And, uh, but it is actually having lots of weights and biases, which is how neural networks store information. And that combination of weights and biases is called parameters. And uh, I'm going to skip through this because this is all from our past. So one of the things you see about neural networks, especially LLMs compared, is this is from my book, The Generative AI, A Primer for Product and Business Managers. In a minute, I'm going to show you, not in a minute, maybe in five minutes, I'm going to show you, uh, talking to my book using one of the one of the sites that does uh, comparison of multiple models. And you can just query it and say, how many parameters? What is a parameter? How many parameters in BERT and Lambda? I explain what this is that. And you know that's, how, that's what I'm hoping, that you'll be able to have a conversation, like you're having a conversation with me. In my absence, you can do this. So you don't even need to think about who's watching, what do I know, and this hesitation, and all that stuff as you're learning. So that's where I'm going with this. But parameters is basically weights and biases. And they have many, many layers of uh, neurons, like in, in any neural network. That's why the deep learning is big. But within that, the way the weights and biases are, you know, is even more bigger number. And why is it important when there is this number is big? Why is everybody bragging about it and say GPT says it's 175 trillion parameters? And uh, the numbers go started out from millions, and that now they are many, many billions. So why is that material? What what is the impact of that number? Why is that big number? Is that obviously I'm leading to big number is a good thing. I hate to say that, but it is a good thing. But why? Why is an LLM which is built with a big number better than an LLM which is built with a smaller number? Uh, they have a huge understanding. Yeah. No, I'm reading the. Am I seeing the same message from past? OK, more parameters is more towards natural language. So uh, it is it is like it's creating a tighter connection. It takes, so in the past, which, which it was NLP, you had um, uh, uh, training data, which was words. And so you could feed a book, say. And it was, say, it was taking that and understanding language. 
And now it is because the weights and parameters are the the parameters which is weights and biases which is how what that it grasps knowledge in each neuron in each layer of the neural network and it passes it on and it goes on right till it and it reaches the output and so every time it is making a prediction when you're talking to a chatbot when you're talking to your autocorrect your when i say talking to an ai you're engaging with it it's not just voice but now you also have voice option uh, co coming up in many of the llms and every time it is taking an input and it's guessing the next word in a very simplistic way. If you, I've done this many rounds with Google chat and I'm not uh, Google uh, search. I'm not going to do that again today. If you just talk to any search engine, uh, if you start typing, it's, it's trying to finish the, and the ones that's writing poetry and everything is writing word by word by word to form the sentence. So it is, has a, a deeper understanding of the connection uh, of words uh, to form the sentence. Why is that material for us? Why do we really care what it is? It has, you know, um, yes. So it is. It has better clarity, right? When it is talking uh, to us, it is. Uh, it is talking almost like a human. That anthropomorphical aspect is why there is a big excitement for the the LLMs, right? So the more the more the parameters that matters more, and then as I breeze through it. Uh, the word, it is going to basically take word embeddings or it's called tokenization where it breaks the words into tokens and then it says, okay, I'm going to take uh, assign a number for a word and it's called a vector, right? And vector is essentially, you know, it's a matrix representation. Again, for those of you who have attended this uh, session before, uh, and not this is not open for anybody else who's actually building vectors since we have some developers in the room, so you were not going to tell me this. Uh, what is the number vector actually representing? And we spoke about uh, uh, weights and uh, uh, weights and biases is the parameters, huge parameters is good. Uh, so uh, and this if you zoom in, you're not going to be able to zoom in, but it's showing all similar numbers grouped together. Uh, so vectors is a set of numbers representing the words and sentences. So my question is, what is it representing? So we are still talking the LLM is built by training, feeding a huge dictionary or books and all kinds of content. And it is creating this mental map of embeddings and vectors in his brain. And the vector is a series of number. What is this number? What is this series of number representing? So for every word, that is fed every sentence that is fed is chunked into words for every word there is a vector created vector is just a set of numbers per word for a, for a word embedding so it will have one five six eight uh, whatever uh, for uh, uh, say a dog right so uh, what does this what does this number represent and i said that this can be answered only by the the person who's not building the vectorization or the uh, a developer in the room so um Okay, so anybody else, what are these vectors representing? So every word, this is very important for us to understand. It's very easy to get excited about LLMs as large volume, lots of words, and it's huge parameters. And here is the LLM, which has trillion uh, parameters and compared to the other because it has better knowledge and better semantics and understanding of language, blah, 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 right? Which is all true. Uh, but in its fundamental brain, the LLM before you touch it, because when you reach it, uh, if uh, you're actually talking to inference, even, even if you're a developer and you say, here's the API of the model, because there's a handful of companies who are who have built LLMs because it needed huge GPU power to churn these trillions of parameters and create the model. That's the foundation model, right? So there's a handful of companies because it's expensive to do that. Now, when we have, so they are giving us these models, right? Now we have APIs and we are developers here who are building on top of the API and there are other options that's evolving. That's why we are having this discussion today, right? So now when we are interacting with the LLM, it's going to be some kind of application that is built. So you might be looking to build that application. You might be looking to use an API so that you can go build the application. You might be looking to play with this saying, what's all this hype about? What can I do with it? Or you might just be chatting with ChatGPT or you're suddenly finding that there is chat-like interface in Bing or uh, 
uh, anywhere else, right? So uh, that is where I'm looking at it, right? So for you to think about, thank you. So for you to think about where is the, uh, what is what is this number? So LLM is trained by large volume of data. This data, which large language models, we are talking about words. Yes, there is other interaction that other modalities that is also included in LLMs today. I'm talking about words and letters. We, we spoke about writing poetry and, and language for our, our simplification purposes. So these words, so it's dictionary words, you know, my dog is sitting in front of me. And it's a sentence which may, with many words. So when this is in training by the handful of companies who have done it, we are not seeing that part. We will come to fine tuning. We will still have to use some of it when we take the LLM. And now we want it to do something else for us. We'll get to that. But when we are receiving the LLM and saying, hey, he, the list I showed you, it has been trained by bucket of words. And it's a series of words in a sequence that has been chunked up by the as, as training data broken into words and word embeddings and it has been fed into uh, something that created vectorizations and each vector is essentially a matrix of numbers that's what i was showing you in the previous slide which means for every word in the dictionary for simplicity sake every word in the dictionary that was fed in the training data that is in the brain of the llm eventually it gets into the brain of the llm that's its universe. Every word has an association of a matrix of numbers. So what it is, is it is the relationship. This is what made LLMs better than NLP and every, this kind of deep learning with transformer model better than all other deep learning models from the past. That is that it understands context. So when you say a word, it actually has a relationship of every word to every other word in the dictionary, in its dictionary. What has been fed in its training data is its dictionary. And it has association of every word relative to every other word. And so whether the uh, when you actually, so when it is guessing the next best word, so coming back, what is the LLM doing? It is just guessing the next word. Guessing means it's making a prediction like all AI does. And every AI, when it makes a prediction, there is a confusion matrix and it is not 100% correct, right? So it has a certain level of confidence at which it will make the prediction. And when it makes a prediction, it is just guessing the next word. So when you're talking to chat GPT, when it is doing that autocorrect, when it is writing that poetry for you, it is just trying to not get caught in failing you in getting the next word right. That's all it is doing. And to do that, it has this matrix which says, what is the probability of this number in association with this other number in the dictionary? And it has a, a series like that. OK. OK. So shall I proceed, guys? OK. So uh, there are the, the most common one you keep hearing about is uh, GPT, which is uh, a decoder only model. And I'll tell you in a minute. And BARD powers. Uh, uh, is, it came from uh, pa being powered by Palm, and it is uh, a Google one. And I'm going to skip a bunch of the... Yes, guys, thank you. I'm not sharing. I need a reminder to go back and share my screen again and again. Okay, now I'm going to zip through this because the quiz part is over, okay? Uh, so we went through all this, and we went a little bit more details. I removed all that from here, uh, just to re remind us about you know various different models and and this foundation piece, right? And then where we left last time in the second uh, LLM webinar is how do we think about this to go build the model, build out some application? So the Chat GPT is built on 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 top of. Uh, of GPT, right? So GPT 3.5 Turbo. But to uh, if you are building your own chatbot, like uh, here Zoom has done here, uh, everything is built on top of some LLMs. Before we get to that, it is important to think about this, you know, the prediction it is doing. Is it doing prediction really of just a word? Is it doing a prediction in one direction or two directions and things like that? This is where I left you. So now we have entered the new realm of how do we understand the LLM landscape? So when we make a map of LLM, when you are in a position to pick a, one LLM among all these that you're seeing, how would you ma map the landscape? Just give me uh, what would those parameters be? 
what are you looking at? We spoke about parameters and size matters. So parameters is one and it is large model. So the large piece is large volume. It's been trained. It doesn't matter, right? But it's trained with large volume and the, the way you hear the output it is, is parameters. Now, what else would you look for when you say, you know, this there's this LLM, let me pick this LLM versus something else. And you have to make the decision in your company, in your business or to your clients, what would you be looking at? What is that looking like? So just type your answers. If you think that you're thinking about LLMs, there are multiple LLMs, lay of the land. You have to pick one LLM for your company. What would be the one? It doesn't have to be the ultimate parameter. I'm just, I'm not prioritizing to see the top parameters, but what are some of them? Um, and uh, Yash, uh, I have not been able to go back, look at the link, uh, LinkedIn chat. So if you find questions there, you can bring it here. And as I'm sharing some links, maybe if you can put it there, I'll appreciate that. OK, uh, so you look at training data. You don't get to see the training data. So what are you looking at? Uh, what is the, what is the interface? Is it prompting? Uh, yes. So one of the ways by which you'll interact with LLM uh, is prompting. So you look at the interface. Uh, when you say training data, what are you looking at? Are you looking at how big is the parameters pool? Uh, what are you looking at when you say, I'm looking at training data? Yeah, uh, if we speak about training data in general, uh, uh, let's take an example of uh, chat GPT only, like GPT yeah. 3.5. So yes. it's, uh, if, we, if we see the architecture method or uh, uh, how in the paper that they released, uh, they have clearly mentioned they have been trained more on uh, uh, Reddit data or like uh, GitHub. Ah. Yes. So that particular point training data modulation is different from one model to another. Like okay. BERT is trained on whole research papers and etc. But okay. whereas ChatGPT is not is trained on part, that particular part. Okay. Awesome. Thank you for that. So uh, we were talking about think about the training aspect of it in the LLM. Uh, and now, you know, not too many people actually think about it this way, but the ethics of it, right? Is it, if it is going to be trained on Reddit data, then it, that is the kind of language it is learning, the biases it is bringing, and then how extensive it is. And one of the announcements from OpenAI followed other companies who are basically saying, if you end up using our LLM, and if somebody sues you because it has been trained on data that doesn't, you know, that belongs to them, we will protect you. I was just thinking it was mind blowing. Some, and this is not the first company, OpenAI joined the other companies who are already offering this protection. So if you are an enterprise and you have somebody like uh, uh, Yashwant on your team, and he says, wait a minute, this is, to, look at the list of training that they're claiming. This is not public data. They're going to come and sue us because when we build a chatbot for our customer service and it is going to quote something from here, and somebody's going to come and, and claim that, uh, or it is biased because it is trained on some data like uh, that you like a forum that you are not comfortable with. Then uh, they're basically saying, "We will protect you." So that is one of the parameters that is bubbling up. And OpenAI was behind because they didn't offer it. Now they've joined the pool of other big tech companies who are saying because they have so much money and they think it is okay to say that we will cover you if you are sued. That's a parameter. That, that, that's a comparison parameter these days in LLM. So thank you for that. Uh, the other thing is, uh, the most common one is uh, whether it is open source or closed. So that's a very common thing that everybody discusses, right? And there has been discussion brewing about, you know, uh, should we go with open source or not? So uh, why does it matter? Again, give me your answer. Does it matter if yes, it matters or not? Why does it matter whether it is open source or not? Okay, I'm going to zip through this uh, so that we can move forward. One is if it is a closed platform existing vendor, you're going to be logged with one vendor. This is the number one question everybody asks me when I'm visiting companies saying, hey, I can help you understand generative AI and enterprise LLM. What are you planning to do? Let me help you with a framework of how to think about this to arrive at business problems and you know go build something, right? And the first question is, 
should I go with an open? Uh, they most enterprise would be reluctant to go with a closed platform because they will be logged with one vendor. And we've been through this in the uh, the world of uh, phones, right? If you pick iPhone versus Android, and you are a small startup or a new uh, new uh, branch of a company that is coming with something, then you have to invest two set of resources and have a set of people who are building for iPhone, set of people who are building for Android. And then you have the mobile web and whatnot, right? And so, and then uh, the thing is, today they are also making promises on bringing down the cost and all that stuff. But once you are, once you are committed and you've made that investment to go with one platform or the other, it happened in the car too. So, in the in the connected car, when you are building, what are the platforms? And there are a few options. Again, you know, so then you you kind of get logged in or one versus the other, and so. Uh, after you're logged in, now if they change the pricing on you, or then you find out the ethics of what they're trained in, like Yashwant was able to find out, or you know, uh, there there's privacy concerns on what they will do with your data. They say, believe me, that we will not use your data. Now, what if they change their mind in that future model? Uh, once you're you're married, right? You're stuck with that particular model. Right. And the big thing with the uh, uh, enterprises, you want service level guarantees. And so then if you go with the open source and if it looks cool, but if it's a small company, will they be able to give you that service level guarantee? This is the other side of it. Right. So we say, OK, OK, I don't want a vendor lock, but I go with op open source. Then how are we going to get the service level guarantee so that I can actually build an enterprise level business which has failovers and uh, uh, th there is redundancy baked in and an enterprise does that large scale systems are built like that right with a lot of redundancy failover they don't like one vendor behind the scene they will have multiple vendors for everything and so that's the thinking so one of the things they say is is how is it this is going to end is it going to be what is going to be the steady state of where this landscape of llms is going to end and uh, thanks to uh, Vanama Yashwant, who is here uh, talking to us. This is something that he's maintaining as a, a spreadsheet. And I just got a, a screenshot of that. So he's talking about which are all open source and commercial. So there's a lot of companies which are providing open source, but they're also saying, OK, now we are giving you a commercial version of it. We will give you service level guarantees. And work with us. So that is where we are going in, in this LLM world these days. And then there's a bunch of these which are closed source. And I remember Cohere comes under the closed source, but they've also come up with a project uh, called AYA, A -Y -A, uh, where it is that part of that alone is uh, open source. And they're saying, we want to add support for multiple languages. So if you want to work on your language of the world, and recently I heard this from a university student uh, uh, for Persian language, they were calling somebody. And she reached out to me saying, is this something that you would be interested in? I don't know Persian. I'm interested in diversity with all languages from my other project from Global South in AI. And so that's how it came to me. And that AYA project is actually uh, open source and commercial, and rest of it is closed source. So that is one one up way of thinking about it. And then uh, the other thing is to think about the capability. Finally, you're not here. If you're a developer, you're playing with it, trying things, great. You should not limit yourself on anything. But when you get to a place, we are going to go talk to your business people and say, let's let me show you what I built. Now we need to go build a pilot on this. Show me or your actual. Uh, uh, data, let's go build something with it, then they're going to say, they're going to ask a lot of questions, right? So it becomes important to think about what are the capabilities of the LLM. So uh, this is a framework that I teach about saying, you know, think about the general uh, generative AI capabilities and then see what kind of customer problem you want to solve, what kind of data you have, map that, and then come up with the product feature. And I give this Zoom uh, AI assistant as an example that they have our, our meetings and the transcript from the meetings without privacy invasion, they can actually take the transcript now, provide summarization. Summarization is one that all of you spoke about. So that is a Gen AI capabilities. What are other Gen AI capabilities? What are other LLM capabilities that makes us so, feel so excited about this? So. 
I'm getting to the landscape, thinking about the slicing dicing of the landscape. One uh, common one is, yes, it is open source or, or closed. Uh, then there are companies who are saying, now we can give you a commercial version of the, the, the open source. Now we are saying, okay, now, it's not stabilized, but at least you can see the lay of the land and then you can you know, go forward from there. And the question is, is that open source, closed source world going to stabilize just as the, the iPhone Android world, which is what all the top companies, the big companies, they made a huge investment. And that's the place they are coming from. They're saying, we have billions of uh, 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 parameters. So that much training we've invested. It is our property. We own it. Now we want to be, we want to monetize it and we want to get our money back, right? So if they've, they've built training and built the foundation models. And so now they're saying, now use us and use us as the platform, not the other guys. And they are uh, trying to lock you in, right? That is the game. That is the... Uh, their more business strategy, rightfully so, because they made an investment in large language models. And so that's where they're coming from. Now you're looking at it and saying it's open source. How is it going to settle down? Is it going to go towards, there's a whole set of innovation that's happening in the open source world. And that is going towards creating this more like a Linux model. So where you can provide a SLAs for enterprise, they won't be logged in. You can build on top of it. And the way we went so much into why and how it works and how to think about the underpinnings of, of LLM is because you get the foundation model. It's not a tool that you just open and it works for you. It's like opening the dictionary. It's just a talking dictionary. So now it has to provide customer service. It has to provide this AI assistant. It has to provide the summarization and it can do a few more other things that we will get to the capabilities. So to do that, you have to do some fine tuning with your own data. So remember the concept of AI, and I always talk about technology industry versus if you are the enterprise customer uh, who is going to do, uh, you know, benefit from this. You start with the business problem and all that is right. But what I'm talking about the building process, the AI life cycle is it is built in technology industry with the data which they perceive as data that is closer to enterprise data. They build the model. Then they come to you as a vendor, and then you model the AI, right? So you take the AI, put your data, and you retrain it, and then it becomes something that is workable on which you can build an application. It's the same thing. Just because it's LLM and transformer and it's chats in the examples doesn't mean anything different. It is the same thing. They've built with this foundation model. Now you have to retrain with a small data set that is yours. So this is this, this is, they've done the unsupervised learning with the whole gamut of world data and from Reddit and everything else. Now you have to do a small supervised learning layer on top of that, right? So that is your data. And that is what you're, you're worried whether it is open source, closed source, because you're betting on that foundation layer. But what kind of capabilities are we talking? What is it going to do? So a very obvious one is that it can chat. Everybody talked about uh, summarization. Yes, it can take huge volume of content, extract knowledge, and summarize it. And it looks very decent when you know you get this on uh, you know uh, from uh, from Zoom. Uh, it doesn't understand if I'm talking about a person who's not in the room and mention this. And I mentioned Yashwant, and Yashwant is here. That's okay. And it will say Sudha, talk to Yashwant. Yashwant answered this because it heard Yashwant's voice, right? And if it doesn't hear Yashwan's voice, I remember talking about an author and a book and it talk, and, and Zoom AI thought that that person was in the room. So it doesn't have that context because it is just linearly hearing voice and names, right? So I, I wouldn't blame it for that. At my, maybe my bar is low there. And uh, so that is a limitation, but it is doing a decent amount of uh, job with, you know, with summarization. What other capabilities would you want? So here you have some customer problem. Here you have, you know, well, your data. We're going to fine tune with your data on an LLM. We are going to bet on one LLM. What else would you want it to do? What are the capabilities that you're going to map so that you can build the product? What other things should it be doing? You guys had a bunch of things like that uh, when you were uh, writing about what it can do. A lot of you were talking about uh, summarization, and I think uh, uh, one person talked about the, the training part. So that's great. So, But tell me more. What other capabilities would you want the LLM to have? Anything, anybody? 
No? Okay. So then let me go back to the share. And you know this. Sometimes it just, you know, when I put you on the spot like this, it just feels like, oh, I don't know if I'm saying the right thing or what is it? And you might blank out. I would do that in your place too. So, so the common, uh, I'm going to go into this because this is a very important set of uh, factors that people are comparing and uh, understanding. So uh, mission translation is the obvious one. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop the share. I'm actually going to show you. Uh, uh, let me see if I have a mission translation window. I thought everything nicely set up, guys. OK, I'm just going to do a, a Google Translate. OK. Um, Going to come back. Yes, I've not shared my screen. I'm going to share now. OK, so um, the thing that I always tell people is uh, every single AI is AI is pervasive. It's here. It's in front of you. So you can play with it too. If you're reading something and I said that, oh, this AI is, you know, BERT does bi-directional and GPT does single directional. What does that mean? You do not have to take my word or anybody's word for it. AI is looking at you to use it all the time. It's everywhere, all in our devices, all over our life. And anything that you want to understand, you should test it. And that's how you're going to understand whether it is real. So here, I'm going to do a translation and I'm going to say uh, I. So there are two things you can see at play here. As soon as I type a, a letter, it is giving me suggestions, right, on what else I might be going for. And so it says I am. And so here I have this in uh, Italian. It says io. I am. And immediately it is io sono, but it took the io out. I am. Um, let me do this. Let me. I am going. And so what I want you to see is it is not like in your autocorrect. If you're giving an English sentence and you're expecting this in Italian or any other language, it is now it is it has to translate the I am going. So the I was different. I am was different. Now, as soon as I say I am going, uh, it basically changed the whole uh, uh, sentence. Right. So it has to. So it is not just guessing. This is where it is not just guessing the next word. Now it has to give me the entire translation of I am going and I'm going to say I'm going to and see it's changed again. Right. I'm going to run. And so it has come back. The EO with, we started with has come back. And so the point I wanted to make is when you're doing a translate machine translation is one of the capabilities of um, LLMs, right? And what it is doing is it is doing bi-directional. So for every word, remember in its brain, it has a map of every word with every other word and it created a vector for every single word. So when it is making a recommendation, which is what we saw on the left and it says, is this what you want to say? Is this what you want to say? It is guessing the next word. And it was just going single directionally. But when it does the whole machine translation, it needs to know. So now think about this whole long sentence. And I've done demos like this where I'll keep on going and I will trick it to see whether I can make it to a new sentence that it was not expecting. Is there a comment? OK. Oh, there are more uh, ideas on what else can it do. OK, thank you for that, Yash. So two lessons here. One, I showed you that you can go to any kind of thing that you hear in this LLM world, however complex it is and however hyper and buzz it looks like. You have to test it out. You can test it out. You don't need to go pull an API in a Python notebook and go do this. You can test it out because the AI is talking to you. That's one. And here, what we saw was this, that machine translation uh, is one of the capabilities, and it does it bidirectionally. So we did that. OK, so I'm going to go back to my deck, and I want to go back to other capabilities. So I have put together uh, one slide which gives you a bunch of them in one place. So machine translation. And remember, we said it is taking a sequence into another sequence, and it's making a prediction, right? And so that we did. 
and uh, response generation is when it will you talk to it and understands context that's what chat gpt is doing and it gives you it understands context and it's it keeps a dialogue so to building something into a dialogue think about this in the previous uh, world of uh, deep learning you trained it with a whole bunch of data it was making able to make a prediction right now it it is not just making a prediction of a sentence but it remembers the previous sentence in context and it has to go that so that is the capability which is response generation right and uh, the text generation give me an example of text uh, text generation what we saw right or the auto correct what you see on your messages on your on your phones all the time and it is text generation in the uh, the machine translation window it was doing text generation on the left for what i was going to potentially type uh, in english right and then it did the machine machine translation in italian then that's what we saw on the other side right uh, the other thing most commonly not talked about, and this is where you need to go back to understanding the capabilities, and you need to know what are you going to do with the LLM for your company. You may not need one LLM. Maybe you need different LLMs, and you need a portfolio of LLMs, and then we are not at that stage, but the LLMs will talk to each other. They don't, uh, but we might get there if, if the enterprise demands that, right? And so um, the classification is uh, basically... Uh, in the past classification, right? When you say we are doing machine uh, classification, what are we doing? We are basically taking structured data and we are labeling it. And this is good, this is bad. This is a dog, this is a mop. This is an apple, this is an orange. This is a good tire, this is a faulty tire. And so we are going to organize our data or this is a customer who's churned and this is a customer who won't churn, right? And uh, things like that, right? For everything, we are kind of adding a single column and or binary classification, or we could have multiple cl cl classification columns too. But we are basically taking a data and labeling it, right? In the context of LLM, what it means is it is it is going to pr it is going to do some kind of clustering, which is saying this set of words and this set of words, and then we are going to say add a label. And the most common example that you use is for sentiment analysis. And you say, here is all the customer feedback that came back. These are happy customers. These are unhappy customers. This is what we need to look at. This is how the clustering of topics that they are complaining about are pricing. This is the clustering of information they're complaining about our, our service. And then you go and say it is positive and negative. So the, the the clustering of that data, of your data that you're going to fine tune, is going to be done by the LLM as you know into different clusters and then the labeling of the sentiment of good and bad. So now I want to see what are the top three issues that my customer service bot is telling me that customers care about. So the LLM will do the clustering part. And then within that, I want to see what is the, the breakup of positive and negative sentiment. And then I will say, OK, we have a lot more people who are unhappy about this one topic. Now let's go fix it. So think about it that way, right? If you're going to, don't think about it as I can do a chatbot. He gives me a chatbot. Everybody's building a chatbot. This is great. It's going to be an intelligent chatbot. You can do all that when you're a developer, you're playing with it. If you're a developer uh, or a data scientist who's going to build this and work with a real business person, you need to go past that excitement. And you have to think about this as what is the problem. Again, think about when I say business problem, people say customer service, we will automate in uh, using a chatbot and it will reduce call center volume. That is still a thousand foot view, right? You talk to anybody who is operationally responsible for customer service and look at their numbers, they're going to say that. Now, thinking about the top three issues, understanding how do you cluster it? How do you, how in an intelligent way so that you can automate this how do you understand what are the top issues? And within the top issues, you want to deal with the sentiment and you you know to you go to management and say, this is a top issue. And they'll say, is this a big enough set of customers? Are our top paying customers impacted by this? Do we really need to put the money for it? So that is where you're going to come from. So think about the capabilities of the LLM tied to what you want to do with it. This is where the other version of looking at it. So the one is looking at the open source uh, uh, closed uh, platform option we were talking and uh, and this is how you should think about the capabilities and you will see a lot of capabilities map and we did this example you can actually go to google uh, or bing and it gives you a capability to chat so the chat gpt is the most common one everybody does so this is uh, uh, i modified one of the charts that was put together by uh, cobus grayling 
and updated it because this was done in 2022. So some of these have changed. So the reds and yellow, the uh, the greens have updated a little bit. But this actually says, okay, is it commercially available or open source is a common thing? That's the first thing, right? Is it the other column that he has done is, uh, is it available publicly or is it still in, still in beta or only developers can play with it, right? And so then, then it comes to the capabilities of, of what we were talking about, right? That uh, whether it can do this uh, translation and all the text generation and all that stuff, right? And whether you can do fine tuning, whether it is available, right? And uh, the last thing that he has added that, that uh, the Acobus has added that I like is, is it multilingual? If it is going to talk only English, or is it going to provide support? So one of my favorite uh, LLMs is Bloom. I've had conversation with uh, uh, one of my Yashwantin here is because it provides multilingual support. But also uh, there is this uh, no language left behind, which is uh, from Meta, which is also providing uh, you know uh, zero shot learning and into 200 languages and so that also comes under the multilingual one so when you look at people who are coming from other countries outside of of us or people who are are anywhere in the world looking at supporting customers who are diverse speaking multiple uh, languages and you want to you know reach that market intuitively then if it does not provide this then it is all great with your pilot but it you're going to lock out a whole set of your customers in there so that's the other the other thinking. And then the last piece, and I think somebody mentioned this in the beginning on whether it is available, uh, you know, how are we going to, you know, the whether it's available as a, uh, how is it available? In what form is it available, right? So how would, how would you spend, what would you spend to integrate into your workflow? If, if you build this beautiful chatbot for your customers, if you build this machine translation for multiple customer support, if you do all kinds of things in a pilot, in a, in a demo pilot, then it has to scale to a pilot for your customers, then it has to scale into production. So a lot of topics and webinars you see is about deploying LLM. So when you do the, the uh, testing and playing with LLMs in the early stage, we tend to forget the deploying piece and that's where it stops. Especially with AI, a lot of these get stuck in pilots. And so it is important to think about, okay, then how is this going to integrate into my workflow? Are you going to spend a lot of money for it? Is it going to be very time intensive? Or do you need to hire a whole bunch of people with new skills to do that? So again, think about the LLMs on what kind of tooling is available to integrate this. The most common one in, in OpenAI, there's a bunch of others they call playgrounds where you can just go chat with it and test it out. We've done this course on prompt engineering. So there are ready-made prompts available and you can try that. And I was surprised because I, I tried one thing uh, with OpenAI when we take a whole data set and we say we want to go uh, 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 fine tune it and build out uh, with GPT-4, uh, they don't provide hosting, right? I, my data set has to, uh, it's creating a vector, but I need a vector database and it has to sit somewhere and then there's a hosting. So Hugging Face, you'll see a lot because Hugging Face, you know, supports that it's called Spaces and there's a lot of different uh, uh, APIs that they intuitively call. So one uh, example I want to show, uh, which one is this? This is called Spaces. Uh, this is from Hugging Face, and uh, it this is the concept of spaces that they have, where you can actually start free, and then it'll give you this much uh, CPU power and this much disk, and then you upgrade, and then this is the price, and you know. So it's important to understand what you're committing to, where you're going. But they have this concept of the spaces, and then the other thing um, I saw, uh, are you guys able to see the the new uh, tab that I switched to? Uh, is comparing multiple LLMs models. And in, this is one of the spaces that has been set up on Hugging Face. I actually tried this chatbot arena, so I would recommend you look at this. Uh, are you able to see the URL also in the? Yes. OK. So uh, I would recommend putting this URL on the um, the chat in, in LinkedIn. Otherwise, I'll come back and put a bunch of these links, guys. Don't worry. So um, this chatbot arena is one which is crowdsourced. So basically, you know, uh, you have two chatbots and you ask them a question. You give a prompt 
uh, you don't this is not coding based and you just say between the two and then you say this is better this is good or both are neutral and then you know you, they're getting a ranking of that uh, so that is the one and there's a bunch of others like that and so they have like uh, you know a bunch of uh, ranking and then within that they remind you this is proprietary or non commercial llama is one where there's a whole community that is brewing so you'll see a lot especially if i'm going to new rips end of the year this llama 270b chat there's a bunch of papers that i'm seeing that you know workshops that i'm seeing uh, so if you are going to be uh, with me or i will see if i can you know stream some of that uh, for you uh so the comparison of the different models would be a good thing uh for you to see and if you just want to you know build a chatbot that's okay too all you have to do is just compare and see so uh i want to go to this window so this is one i did during sudha live but i wanted to share with you here so uh what i have done is this is uh, gpt.h2o.ai you can upload any file so i just uploaded the the pdf of my book generative ai primer for product and business managers and now it is ingested it and you can select any model it is selected four models i am going to leave it if i want to specifically test out one of the models i will change it here and i will say um do you guys have a prompt uh what are hallucinations so if i want to learn what is hallucinations i it is going to go query the book and say what i thought in the book and i published this book in april so i myself don't remember what exactly i said so let us see what so there are four of these windows from four of these models uh, gpt 3.5 turbo is what uh, chat uh, gpt has been built on and they have upgraded the, well, recently that's what they've said uh, it used to be stuck at september 2021 they fine tune it till the a recent data from the internet so it is now going to be stuck in april 2023 till they do the next round so it is not fetched anything why is it not fetched hallucinations that's the thing with all of these right it is taking time or it is not done okay what is a llm hallucination that's the thing there's information in the brain of the llm now in this case it has taken my book in its brain so it needs to get the information right we need to prompt it right and so i just said hallucination it didn't like it but when i said the llm hallucination this model is much more intelligent according to the information provided hallucination in the contact of ll nlp uh, so this one is just slow it's waking up and it's coming so it is saying what are these hallucinations right and it is explaining okay all of them are bringing it back from the book so not bad uh so then maybe you know if you say okay now i understood what it is um so what are some ways to mitigate hallucinations i don't think i wrote this hallucinations in llm and we'll see whether it gives that and uh, one of the common questions that everybody asks is what do you uh how do you do how do you get the to use a llm if you have less data so um what are some ways to mitigate it is thinking thinking it's going to come with something uh let's see what it says so that's the idea so what i have done here is i've just uploaded my book and i want you to chat and then learn this thing i could have said what are open source models and how many parameters that gpt4 have and all those things it will come and it will uh, come from there and you know uh um, but it's kind of slow okay based on the information provided oh it is this one is this one seems the fastest one let me see what this is the one at the top here right oh come on don't do that to me okay so this is the oh this is h2o dot uh, the h2o ai people's llama 2 this is what i'm saying this llama 270b has been i'm hearing a lot about it so uh i would like to see whether you can play with it and do something and bring it back and so um based on the information provided which is the book that's the source right that's why it is quality so you can ensure the data quality train to train the llm is high and relevant this is what uh, yashwant was saying check the data that they've used if they've used poor quality data if it is biased and is full of errors then it's going to reflect on your llm you can do adversarial training 
to train the LLM to be robust, right? You can do some kind of control generation technique, and then I've given a bunch of them. You can do a human evaluation, and uh, uh, you can actually do a constraint generation, uh, such as you're conditioning the model on a prompt, right? So, so that using prompt to do that, you can do data augmentation, you can use regularization techniques. And, you know, so this one has just picked up a bunch of things that I've said in the book, right? Uh, so the others seem to have some version of that. This one doesn't have that yet, right? And then I, I can go on and, and, you know, you can just learn what it is saying in the book, or you can say, um, how can I build uh, LLMs using less data. This is a favorite question everybody asks. I don't remember what I've said in there. There's a lot of different techniques again. So you get the idea, right? So I want to stop the share. So uh, I was showing this to show how you can do a comparison of multiple different uh, chatbots. That is one that you should try and do so that you can actually understand. So don't invest in one of them. And that is the fun part of playing with all of them that I love about this. OK, so uh, with that, we've come to the end of our session. Uh, so we looked at how they work in the brain, understand the capabilities, then understand open versus closed, uh, and then you know how it is going to integrate into your enterprise broadly. That is how you think about that. And then there are many of these. You can go to ChatGPT. I asked ChatGPT to give me a list of open source uh, LLMs. It, didn't, it said, there isn't anything open source from uh, OpenAI, and left me at that. Um, they've upgraded to a newer version. So hopefully it will be a little bit more intelligent and more honest and tell us there are other open source models out there. Uh, went and asked this in um, in uh, Google search and it gave me a list. Uh, I did that uh, at Sudha Live last week. You can just go talk to the LLMs. As I said, every single terminology, every single concept, every single claim, you can just test it out. Just, just think about, okay, what AI do I have at my disposal? And what do I have on my phone? What do I have in WhatsApp? And what do I have in search engines? What do I have in the in the options that is given by various vendors? What do I have in all these different sites that are comparing different models? And so if you think about it, you've got everything at your disposal. You just need to think about, like the example I gave you with the uh, customer service uh, bot, right? And the capabilities we were talking about go deeper. There's lots of reports out there which gives you a thousand foot view and even gives you case studies and it gives you like amazing possibilities. It's very easy to feel like, oh my God, everybody else is doing it and I'm not doing it. That's not true. Okay, so uh, with that, I'm going to wrap up. Uh, thank you everybody who's been a great sport and I know you are in different time zones and you have a life and you have your work and still you find time to come. And so I hope this was uh, helpful and I will uh, have this recording in the streaming on uh, on uh, LinkedIn that you can watch if you're coming back, tag a friend if they missed it. Or we, uh, I will obviously put this out. Uh, it is going to be on my on my YouTube, and we will uh, link it back. Uh, thank you to Paria Sarin. She will put it out in our uh, in, the, in the Jamte newsletter that goes out. So you'll have access to it. And if you're one of our regulars who has access to uh, the uh, Teachable platform on Business School of AI from my courses. Uh, this all these recordings will be there, so you can go find that. And if there is an interest, you want to see a bunch of these webinars called out as webinars. I've had people asking for wanting to, you know, get a certificate from attending these webinars. If there is an interest, I can put a bunch of these LLM uh, webinars together, and I plan to do a few more too. So with that, I'm going to wrap up. If there is any other top next level topic that you would like to uh, uh, learn more, I'm happy to help you with that. And thank you, everybody. Stay safe. And I'll see you back online. And if you have any follow-up that shows up and you say, I didn't think about this and I think this is different, I've played with this and it looks different, talk to me or just come right in the in the LinkedIn chat, in the LinkedIn uh, stream where you're seeing. I will come back. I will reply. I'm going to share some of these links there, but I like to watch because more people usually come back and watch this. And uh, if you have questions, I will try and get you answers. Together we learn. Thank you, everybody. With that, I'm going to stop the stream. Thank you. Stay safe. Bye.